Okay, so tell me a little bit about yourselves and how you got started in the disability community. I can start. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm Bridget McNamee. I have, um, I started in the disability community um, in the early childhood education space. So I was a special education preschool teacher for a few years and then transitioned to an assistive technology specialist for a few years and then um, transitioned to higher education to student accessibility services. And I did that for about 14 years. And then most recently, the last two years, I've worked in corporate human resources um, it, doing workplace accommodations for employees. And I'm Kirsten Beeling. I am an Associate Dean of Student Accessibility and Academic Resources at Tufts University, which is in Medford, uh, Massachusetts. I fell into the field, um, as I think most disability service providers fall into the field because I have a, either a, a, um, a relative with a disability or often we have disabilities ourselves. Um, and so I started my work in doing grant funded research through the US Department of Ed, Office of Post-Secondary Ed. We were looking at um, how to support students who had not yet graduated high school to attend classes at a um, college and to get credit for them. Um, and I really loved doing that work. I also started doing a lot of research around the concept of universal design for learning. And what I realized was I was doing a lot of traveling to different institutions and sort of saying, you should do this or you should do that without understanding um, the challenges that each institution may have, which prevented them from doing more accessible work. So I decided to jump into the field formally as a disability service provider to better understand um, the background um, at an institution and, and try to understand how we can support students in a more accessible manner. Mm -hmm. My next question, tell me about your work in the disability community. Let's start with the academic side first. You know, what's that about, you know, in higher education? Yeah, sure. So um, in higher education, a student, um, we welcome all students. Um, and what they do is they um, apply through the general admissions program. Once a student is admitted to an institution, um, they have a right to seek access or accommodation related services associated with their disability. So it's different than the K-12 world, um, especially in the public school where the K-12 world is governed by um, the Individualized Education Act. And a lot of students coming out of um, that environment will have an individualized education plan or an IEP or a 504 plan. Um, in college, we are governed differently. We are governed by the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, which says that we need to be able to provide services for students that come in that meet the same requirements as other students. So for example, one of the biggest differences is we can't modify the curriculum in college like they might be able to do in, in a higher ed or in a K-12 setting. But um, the other biggest difference, which I think is a struggle for some students with disabilities, is that students need to seek us out. Um, and we, there is no sort of governing body in terms of what disability services is called in higher ed, what our names are, where we sit geographically, organizationally. And so it can be a real challenge for students to get the services that they need. But once a student has self-advocated, said, hi, I'm here, I'm excited to be here, but I need some resources. Um, each disability office has a different sort of set of the way in which we work with students. Typically that includes the student bringing some type of documentation of their disability to the office and then meeting with a specialist in that space to figure out what could be the potential access barriers in a collegiate environment and what accommodations would be appropriate without modifying the curriculum um, to support the student throughout their journey in higher ed. Mm -hmm. All right. So, Kristen, since you work in the on, in the financial side of things, I was wondering, um, you know, there's another side of accommodations besides the traditional academic um, setting. So, like, what what does you know that entail from like the financial side in terms of accommodations and things like that? Was that a question for me? I'm sorry. Yeah, that, yeah, no, yeah. Yeah. And the in the for from the employment standpoint, mm -hmm. 
Yes. Okay. So it's, it's actually very similar work. Um, the, the, from higher ed to employment in terms of, we're just trying to find reasonable accommodations to provide access, except instead of programs or courses, we're really looking at essential job functions. Um, so that we are governed by the ADA, just like higher ed, but we also have the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC um, guidelines, Department of Labor, um, there's individual state um, laws and regulations that we have to manage because the company I work for is is nationwide, so we have to be on top of those things. Um, but it's really about can you do this job with or without reasonable accommodations? And what reasonable accommodations can we identify that are kind of modifications or adjustments um, that don't take away an essential job function, right? So for example, if you're someone who works in a call center and your role, you're, you know, you're just taking calls all day long and you request an accommodation to not take phone calls, well, that's not reasonable, right? Because the essential function of your job is taking calls. If you need more breaks in between calls, right, to reset, to manage your condition, to take medication, to, you know, whatever the, the issue is, well, then that may be a reasonable modification to your schedule, right, and allow you to do the essential functions of your job with that accommodation. Um, but it is very, very similar work in terms of looking at what, uh, you know, what are the essential functions, what are the access barriers, and how can we identify ways to mitigate barriers while also maintaining the integrity of, of what needs to be done? Mm -hmm. Cool. So you guys recently wrote a book called Disability Services in Higher Education. You know, what's that about? You know, what motivated you to write these this book? Yeah, so this is a, a book that has been um, a dream of ours for quite some time, and Bridget and I were lucky enough to, to write it with three of our colleagues, Lisa Babo, um, Eileen Belmore, and Andrew Chiaffi, who are also disability service providers. Um, and part of the reason we wanted to write the book is, as I had said earlier, is there's no sort of formula or foundational um, requirement for how disability services uh, are provided in higher education. And that can often be a barrier for students who are looking at different schools and trying to decide what's the right fit for them, what resources are right. Um, some schools have different documentation requirements. Some schools will meet with you once and then you're good to go. Others require you to check in every semester. Um, some schools support housing, others don't. So there's a lot of variation in how disability services um, is provided in higher education. So our goal was to take our combined experience, which Bridget, I think is over 70 years once we- I think, yeah, I think it, it was 73 years or something. <laughs> something like that, which is a little bit shameful to think through, but, um, and, and all of the different institutions we've worked at, which includes state, state schools, four-year schools, and two-year schools, and to try to offer disability service providers primarily a roadmap for how to do the work. But the book also speaks to students who are transitioning, students and their families who are transitioning to higher ed, um, giving them suggestions and guidance on what questions to ask and, and how to approach that experience, as well as sort of consider, um, guidance to faculty and staff that are maybe working in higher ed who are not sure how to engage with a student or how to support a student in a classroom or even a residential setting. Um, so it's it's really very much um, the first of its kind. Um, and what Bridget and I are particularly proud about is that it comes with uh, a set of documents that we have acquired over our 73 combined years um, that people can utilize, manipulate, take, download, do all the things to make their life easier. So intake forms to um, presentations that you might give at orientation, um, to agendas, to even things like how do you manage a growing office or how do you advocate for resources? 
Mm -hmm. Did I miss anything, Bridget? No, I think it's just, it's everything that the five of us wish that we had access to as we built our programs and our offices, because so often these are one person offices at, you know, even pretty large institutions, you're kind of a very standalone, it can feel very isolated and, and to not have a template to work off of, you know, can be really challenging. So we're just hoping to take all of our experience and our diverse, um, the diverse settings that we've worked in uh, to create a, a pretty broad, um, you know, resource and tool that can be applied, like we said, to like any, any type of environment that you're working in. Um, and whether you're brand new or revamping or, you know, or even, you know, a lot of times in our area, the field, um, we get kind of moved around and, and we get put under an administrator that maybe has no idea what we, what we're supposed to do. So this is also a really good resource for them um, to help understand kind of what the meat and potatoes is of, of the work and what, what we need. Mm-hmm. My next question here is, what are some of the things that companies often miss when helping with a student with a disability in an academic setting or someone in a financial setting? Let's start with the financial aspect first. I think the missed opportunities always come down to rigidity, right? People thinking that things need to be this way because that's how they are and not thinking about, well, what do we really need someone to be able to do, right? And does it matter how they get there? Sometimes it does, right? But a lot of the times it doesn't. And so it's all about the how and helping people think differently about ways to get, you know, to the deliverable that you need them to get to in terms of what their essential job functions are. Um, and I think that can be really, really difficult um, because it's a totally different way of thinking. I think, you know, in, in the professional setting, um, there's a lot of um, rigidities, right? Traditions, um, linear thinking, um, and this is new. And this isn't because people don't want to do it. I think it's because it's not necessary. Most of the conversations I have, people have not encountered these types of things before, and they want to understand it and they want to support. But then, you know, we have to work within the, these confines of, of this company and there's, you know, regulations and policies. And so it's a lot of kind of chipping away at that and helping people and influencing people to think um, a little bit differently, just about how we get to where we need to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think in higher ed, there's some similarities. I think there's there's two areas, though, that come to mind immediately. One is the um, the need for students to seek out services. That's a very big cultural shift for a lot of students who have had support throughout their educational experience prior to coming to higher ed. It can also be really challenging for students who are newer to a diagnosis. Um, we're seeing a rise in students coming through with mental health diagnoses, for example, um, that may be newer and they don't know how to navigate the system. So I think a challenge for us as providers is to continue to um, make sure that we try to get our message out in multiple formats. We can't just stand up at orientation and give a 10 minute talk, right? We need to make sure that we're aware of how students are communicating and getting their information and being really thoughtful and deliberate about making sure they know that we're there and able to help them. I think the other challenge that higher ed faces, and, and I'm guessing that employment faces as well, is that um, the way in which we do our work, we are governed by the Americans with Disabilities Act. And every time there is a new um, complaint or, or lawsuit or settlement that comes down, the work is consistently changing. So as providers, if something might come down, for example, I'm just going to talk about hot hot topic button here, which is um, emotional support animals. Do we support them or do we not? And how do we work through that? Um, and so as a provider, we have to be on top of all of the legal changes that are happening on a regular basis. And, and you know, we never want to be purely reactive. So how do we sort of anticipate what could be coming 
and be proactive in the way in which we support our students that benefits everybody, um, ideally from the start. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, my, my last question here is, you know, what can be done to make sure that those individuals, you know, like have what they need in order to, to be successful? Um, let's start with the academic setting, make it a little easier. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so one thing that, that we talk about in the book and that we really promote is as a student is looking for an academic environment, a post-secondary environment or grad school, even, you know, that too, um, that they visit the schools and that, or at least have Zoom calls or conversations and try to get to know the schools and try to understand what types of services the school provides and whether or not it might be a good fit. Um, and schools are absolutely happy to talk to prospective students. Uh, we're excited about it. Um, and in some situations, it may, may be apparent that that school is not the right fit for, for whatever reason. Um, so I think that's something that's really important. The other thing is, is that, again, every school has their own requirements in terms of what validation they need or documentation they need of the student's disability. And so making sure that the student is aware of that before applying um, or at least accepting um, and in some cases, if a school has a strict time frame for diagnostic documentation, making sure you're circling back to your K-12 environment and getting that testing updated, um, if that is required, would be really, really helpful. But transitioning to college, what we're really, you know, the students who seem to be the most successful are those who are outreaching, asking for support, um, know the, the nature of their disability, and can really speak to Gee, in, in high school, you know, I excelled in this particular topic because of this, um, or this particular type of accommodation or assistive technology really helped me moving forward. That information is so critical to us because every student that comes through is their own individual and their journey needs to be respected in that space. And so I don't want to assume that if I saw a diagnosis, it's the same for every student. Rather, it's really important to understand the student's experience with it students' concerns or, or um, worries about transitioning to higher ed and, and how can I um, use the resources I have available to try to alleviate that and help them have a smooth transition. Yeah. And I think on the employment side, the most important thing is the visibility, you know, people knowing that we even exist and, you know, there is uh, an accommodation process at the employment level. And at the same time, the, the stigma issues, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, people are terrified to disclose sometimes because they're afraid it means they're going to lose their job. So I think a lot of my work is education around kind of, this is the process. This is, you know, these are the laws. This is how it works. You know, there's no guarantee that the accommodation that you're requesting is going to be the reasonable accommodation that you receive. And there's no guarantee that, you know, there's there the, that there's job protection in all of this, right? Because it's still kind of, it is, you know, the employment setting. But, um, you know, we exist and we're here and it's, a, you know, disclosure is, you know, safe, you know, to disclose and, um, you know, we exist because there's a need, right? You know, like we are so busy because there are so many different types of needs for just, you know, just adjustments. And they've ranged from very slight, you know, probably don't even need to go through our office to, you know, pretty significant, but there's systems in place for a reason because you know, we want to, our, our whole goal is to help people balance their health and well-being and also get through their day and do their jobs. Right. Mm -hmm. And we want to find reasonable accommodations that help people do that. Right. And that also help business needs be met. Those are, those are the things. So if there's, you know, we want to talk to you about what those might be and troubleshoot and explore and try and you know, help educate managers and supervisors and things like that to just help people stay in their jobs and take care of themselves. Yeah, those are some important points there.